techniques for doing cost optimization. And one of the cornerstones of those techniques is this idea that uh, you can calculate the cost of a certain operation. Um, one of the, the sort of biggest drawbacks of that is that you need to be able to uh, these these uh, various techniques for estimating the cost rely on certain things, rely on knowing uh, certain things uh, about the data. And so far, the only thing that we've really considered is uh, essentially the size of the data. We've made some very strong assumptions about everything else, uh, namely the data is uniformly distributed and various other things. So one of the primary goals of today's lecture is going to be to describe uh, a couple of ways in which you can get better estimates uh, for uh, various things like uh, the size of the sled. Uh, before I get to that though, uh, a quick recap of, of what we've covered so far. Um, so we've talked about a number of different relational algebra equivalencies, and these, how these equivalencies uh, give us a number of different possible ways of computing a query. Uh, a couple of equivalencies on projection and selection that give us the best way to get at the data that we're looking for, uh, as well as a couple of <coughs> a couple of equivalencies on uh, the join operation uh, that give us the ability to um, re reorder the joins and uh, figure out the best way to uh, perform those. And essentially the idea is going to be to, uh, the idea of these, these optimization strategies uh, is essentially to uh, compute all of the possible plans that we're interested in and evaluate the cost of each of those plans. Whichever plan is the cheapest, well that's, whichever plan we estimate as being the cheapest, that's the one we want to go with. And so, once again, and this is going to be pretty much the focus of today's lecture, um, getting that cost estimate right uh, is, is really central uh, to, to these optimization strategies. Because if you get that wrong, and I'll show you how that's possible, um, the, these cost-based optimization strategies will be very poorly. Um, so, uh, that said, are there any questions on uh, any of the optimization stuff we've covered up to this point? Any questions? Okay. All right, so if that's the case, um, I'm going to take a quick uh, step back from the lecture and uh, give you, before I actually go on to the uh, better cost estimation stuff, I'd like to uh, spend a little bit of time covering um, the project, uh, covering the project of the two. Now, if you recall, uh, there are basically two components to this. You're going to build an ISAM index and a hash index uh, with some extra credit for building a dynamic version of IFO. So I just wanted to spend a little time going over some of the concepts that we've already covered in class, uh, just to refresh your minds on this particular. Uh, so, a first quick recap, an ISAM index has a bunch of leaf pages which are stored sequentially on disk and each of them contains, uh, well, in a practical sense, they're going to be either uh, key record ID pairs uh, or key record and they're going to store the full record. Um, in our case, we're going to actually store the full record in the index. Uh, is there a question? Uh, so, these are going to be stored in sorted order on the key, and we're going to build a index on top of them. And this tree index is going to have a bunch of pages, each of which is going to point uh, to one of those data pages. And the way you can sort of do that is to have uh, this alternating sequence of pointer, key, pointer, key, pointer, key, pointer, key. Um, Now, it might be the case that you exceed <coughs> that you exceed the amount of space uh, that will fit in one page, so you'll end up needing to create uh, another page. Uh, if you have a second uh, page to index, uh, index your data pages, you're now going to need to start building indices over the, the, data, the tree pages as well. And so you can do 
that by essentially adding another layer to your tree. Uh, right, so that's the ISA, ISA index. Uh, are there any questions? Everyone remember how this works? Great. Okay, uh, second bit of recap, and this is the easier one. Uh, static hashing, uh, almost utterly trivial. Um, you have a sequence of data pages, of data pages, each page corresponds to one bucket. Uh, when you need to uh, write or read a, um, a record, a record from one of these data pages, you compute the record's hash value, you compute uh, the ID modulo, uh, the number of buckets that you have, and then uh, it basically just write the record to that particular page. Um, if it turns out that you have more, uh, more records than will, than will fit on a single page, you might need to create an overflow page. Um, in the case of an ISAM, an ISAM index, you might need to do this as well, um, although for our purposes, uh, since the index is static, you can probably get away without overflow pages. Okay, uh, again, any questions so far? Uh, so you're going to have a couple of classes uh, in the package to help you. Uh, the first of them is a main function in the class uh, SQL.index. Uh, this main function basically gives you a couple of uh, sort of command line interface uh, to build, validate, and access uh, the indices. Basically, to build, validate, and index um, and, and uh, access the indexes that you're going to be creating. And so. Uh, well, the, the simplest thing, uh, command is going to be uh, index and then either hash or ISAM file name and that will uh, essentially run the series of commands that you're going to write uh, to build an index over uh, a, t a data stream that, uh, that you're going to be provided with. And so there's this class SQL test, uh, test to data stream uh, which defines an iterator over data rows. Uh, Basically, it's going to generate those rows uh, in a random but deterministic way. Uh, so essentially, you can get the same sequence of rows as many times as you like. Um, so those are going to be used uh, to validate your data. And that class has a couple of, uh, of uh, ways of tweaking how it generates those rows. Uh, so for example, you can uh, change the number of key columns. You can change the number of data columns. You can change the number of rows that get generated. And uh, the index command has uh, features for all of them. And I'm not going to er, go over the entire documentation of, of the index command. Uh, the project write-up has all that information in it. Uh, we'll go into a little more depth. Uh, the index uh, command also has the, a couple of flags that you can use for validation. Uh, so for example, if you uh, pass dash get and then a comma separated key, uh, that's basically going to run uh, a lookup on your index. And this is, a, again, a function that you're going to have to implement. Um, so for example, in this case, it's going to return uh, an arbitrary row matching uh, with an arbitrary row for which the key is 23. Uh, keep in mind that there is, uh, while we're going to call them keys, and that there is, uh, they are keys for the index, so they only necessarily appear in the index once, uh, there might be multiple data values for that particular key. And the get command should just return an arbitrary one of them. Uh, for the ISAM index, you're also going to be doing uh, scans over the index. So if you uh, pass dash scan, that will essentially validate that the entire scan uh, completed successfully. And similarly, you can add uh, from and a two, an optional from and a two parameter, in which case it will scan basically from the low end uh, to the high end, and, and it will validate uh, that your scan completed successfully. Uh, that is to say, it will basically test it against the test data stream that I provide you with. Okay, so any questions up to this point? Yes? Uh, so this test data stream method, uh, has a, uh, a method on it called validate, which takes an iterator and
and essentially, sorry, it takes an iterator, a lower bound, and a higher bound, an upper bound, and it will ensure that the uh, the contents of the iterator that you provide it with are equivalent to what it expects to see uh, between that lower and upper bound. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, all right. So a couple more things, uh, a couple more uh, pieces that you're going to be provided with. Um, I'm not going to make you uh, actually write a buffer manager for this. It's uh, a little bit hairy. Uh, but uh, I'm not going to make you write one. So instead, I'm going to essentially give you a buffer manager uh, that you're going to be able to use uh, to implement your indexes with. Uh, right. So if you recall, a buffer manager essentially keeps uh, a set of frames. And each frame corresponds to a chunk of memory that can be allocated to some particular task. That task uh, can either correspond to, uh, sorry, uh, that can be allocated to some particular purpose. Uh, that purpose uh, may be some sort of intermediate computation, or it may be, uh, let's say, it may correspond to a page of a file. Uh, now, each of these frames is implemented, uh, oh, sorry, so the buffer manager itself is implemented as a class called uh, sql.buffer.bufferManager. Um, and it's going to basically keep track of a fixed number of, uh, of an internal Java class called ByteBuffer. Uh, ByteBuffer is actually a very nice interface to, uh, to program uh, arrays of bytes. Uh, you can do things like encoding uh, integers, encoding floats. Uh, all of that is, is considerably easier if you're using a ByteBuffer. Uh, so essentially, the, the interface of the buffer manager is, is basically give me a page uh, and then the buffer manager at some point will come back to you and say, uh, I'm ready to evict that page. Um, now this is not going to be necessarily relevant for this particular project, uh, but in order to simplify your lives down the line, uh, you should get used to this process of pinning. And pinning basically says that a particular page uh, is in use and should not be replaced. Uh, loosely speaking, free and uh, release for those of you who have. Yes? Uh, that buffer manager call, would it be a blocking call? Like, uh, will the control stop it and ask for a page? Uh, the control will stop until the page is available. Yeah, uh, yeah so if, if there's no available page, it will evict a page. Uh, and while the eviction is going on, while the page is getting written to disk or whatever is necessary, um, then he, uh, the call will block. Uh, okay. Um, so basically something to keep in mind is there's, uh, you will, whenever you're using one of these buffer pages, you're going to need to pin it. And whenever you're done with it, you're going to need to unpin it. Uh, there's also going to be a dirty bit that you can set that indicates that you've modified the buffer page and it should be written back to disk. Uh, now, the, the file I.O. portion of this is going to be handled by a class called managed file. Uh, you're also being provided with this. This is basically an interface with the buffer manager. Um, there's a class called file manager that you will uh, give it a file, and it gives you back one of these managed files. And essentially what it does is it uh, allows you to identify uh, so it gives you a big sequence of pages, and you can basically say, "Give me the buffer for page uh, three in this file," and it will give you. It will try and register that uh, particular page with the buffer manager, um, and load it in if necessary, and uh, basically will handle a considerable portion of the, the messiness of uh, paging out and so forth. Uh, basic interfaces to this are going to be get buffer, uh, pin, unpin. Uh, you can set the dirty, uh, the dirty bit so that it will uh, write that page to disk. And then there's a command that lets you uh, force the data back to disk. Uh, OK. Um, any questions so far? Um, one more class that you're, going to get used, uh, that you're going to get for your own use. Um, there's a class called Data, uh, datum buffer. 
uh, which is essentially going to represent a self-describing uh, record. Uh, now this will be probably sufficient for implementing hash table. It may not be sufficient for implementing uh, some of the more complex uh, features of oh, certain aspects of the ISAM index. So you, you can think of this as sort of a template, a simple template for <coughs> how you might implement uh, something a bit more complex. And if you'll recall, there are a number of different ways of laying out data on a particular page, uh, this being one of them. So the end of the page basically has uh, a series of pointers. Each pointer points to uh, one of the records in the file. Uh, this class basically gives you the ability to uh, add a record to the page or read out a, a, a specific record in the page uh, in constant time. Any questions? Okay, um, we got through that uh, really fast. So, uh, any questions? That's basically <coughs> what I have so far in project one. Um, are there any further questions about what you're being expected to do? What sort of challenges you anticipate? Okay, well, uh, if that's the case, then you, everyone's going to get a 90, right? All right, onwards. All right, so getting back to this, uh, to the, the main theme of the class. Um, one of the big challenges of, uh, of this cost-based optimizer is getting a, a legitimate estimate of the cost that, uh, that a particular plan can take. Um, so what kind of information can we use in order to get uh, to improve the estimate that we're, we're getting, uh, that we're making. Uh, and more precisely, how do we get better estimates of these reduction factors that uh, we've been trying to compute? Now there are two kinds of, of data that we might be interested in, in using to compute reduction factors more effectively. Uh, the first of these is uh, statistics about the data itself, uh, but we also, we might also be able to take advantage of properties of the schema. Uh, for example, constraint, uh, the foreign key constraints. So we'll briefly touch on that towards the end of the lecture as well. Okay, so what about uh, statistics about the data itself? Now, so far we've been collecting one very, very simple, uh, well, one, maybe two very simple statistics about the data. Uh, the size of the data and the number of distinct values uh, for, each, uh, for each attribute. Well, that is something we probably want to estimate, so we, we typically end up getting ranges rather than precise values. Now, as a consequence uh, of that, when estimating reduction factors, uh, one of the sort of core things that we had to do there was assume that there was a uh, uniform distribution of values. Uh, so just to recap, um, yeah. so just to recap, uh, let's say we have select a equals one from R. How do we get the reduction factor from that? The size of R, or so uh, let's say we know that a uh, falls within the range. 1 to 100. There might be millions of rows, but let's say this is, for example, grade. Let's say that uh, you're selecting on the grade from all of the, the student uh, assignments, for example. Uh, and you know that that grade falls into the range, uh, well, let's say 65 to 100. And it's an integer. So how are you going to estimate that? 35. 35. Uh, finish the sentence. Sorry. Uh, 35 divided by. Uh, come on. So there. Well, we're just looking for the reduction factor, which is the the number of. 
of the fraction of the tuples that are equal to one another. One divided by three. Uh, yeah. Right. So where'd you get that? Right. So the grade can take 30, uh, 36, 35-ish different uh, unique values, and we're looking for uh, one of them. And the assumption at this point is that that entire, uh, that each of them is equally likely. Um, in general, that's not going to be the case. So what we'd like to do is derive some more useful statistics that we can use to uh, make uh, better estimates. So what essentially I'm trying to say is that these, this assumption of uniform distributions is extremely strong and uh, often leads to some very, very bad estimates. So let me give you an example here. Um, I, I have here a table of people, and each of these people has an age and a rank. Um, now, I have two different queries here. One where I'm asking for the name of every person who has rank 3 and age 20. And one where I'm asking uh, about the names of all people who have rank 3 and age 19. Now, if I assume a uniform distribution, then these two queries are entirely equivalent. Um, here I'm asking for a single age value. Here I'm asking for a single age value. So if the reduction factor uh, based on age is going to be, uh, since there are, in this case, uh, four different age values from uh, 19 to 22 inclusive, uh, the reduction factor for age is going to be one out of four. So we're going to return one out of every four tuples. And we're expecting to, uh, to get one out of every four tuples. Now conversely, there are three different ranks. So the expected reduction factor, the expected reduction factor on rank is going to be one out of three. So in other words, if we have an index on both age, oh, sorry, if we have an in, one index on age and another index on rank, then it will make more sense to do a, uh, a scan over the index on, um, on age, because age reduces, uh, reduces the smallest output size. But now let's, let's go through the, the math here. Let's assume that we have, um, let's assume that we actually do know uh, all of the ages. And let's try and figure out what the absolute best thing that we could possibly do is. So in the case where age equals 20, you'll note there are uh, one, two, three, four different uh, instances of age equals 20. So in other words, uh, the, re the actual reduction factor of this, uh, of this predicate is going to be one out of two. Conversely, uh, the reduction factor of this predicate, since there's only uh, one value of 19, is going to be one out of eight. Does everyone sort of follow where, where I'm getting those numbers from? So in this case, if the reduction factor is going to be one out of two, we may as well scan on rank because that's uh, we may as well use the, the index on rank because that's going to give us far fewer tuples. On the other hand, in this case, we're going to get a dramatic improvement if we use the, the index on uh, on age. This is sort of a toy example, but I mean, imagine if you're talking about uh, gigabytes of data, terabytes of data. Um, and that happens pretty frequently. Uh, even a slight change in the index, uh, sorry, even a slight change in the reduction factor can produce a dramatic change in the actual performance of the query. So getting this estimate, uh, getting the selection of index uh, right is, uh, is, is really important. Um, and getting the costs right is really important. So how do you think we can, uh, how do you think we could potentially do better? So if we had, if we had um, every single, uh, the number of every single one of these uh, attributes, if we, if we knew that there were four instances of 20 
uh, one instance of 19, uh, two instances of 21, and one instance of 22, we could potentially do better, right? On the other hand, how much space would that take up? You know, imagine this is uh, a real database with millions of, of people in it, and each of them has an age somewhere between 1 and 100. Well, okay, that's not too bad, but uh, imagine how much of a pain that would be to maintain. Um, each of them, let's say everyone has, uh, what was a better example? Um, So let's say some sort of uh, floating point number, like, uh, I don't know, uh, income. Let's say you have uh, a whole bunch of incomes uh, spanning a huge range from, I don't know, like a uh, couple of thousand dollars uh, to millions and millions of dollars. This is a huge range of possible values, and you don't necessarily want to keep a counter for each and every one of them. Um, another example would be locations. Uh, let's say you have different cities. Um, there are millions of different cities. Uh, there could be huge numbers of different cities, uh, and each of them we have to keep a separate count for. And in order to, to sort of ask how many people there are in any of these given cities, we'd essentially have to run uh, a query that was almost as bad as running the original query. So, uh, what can we do about that? We have all of this huge amount of data uh, that tells us how many people have the same age or how many people live in a particular city. Do we necessarily care about all of that data? At least in that sort of, uh, to that level of detail. So what if we knew um, how many people live in, let's say, New York State versus uh, any given city in New York? That might be equivalently useful. What if we knew how many people were uh, in uh, 10 to 20, uh, 20 to 30, 30 to 40, and so forth? That would, that would still help us. Maybe not as well as knowing each individual value, but we could still use that. So we can tally up all of the, the values that we're interested in, uh, but we can keep averages not just for each of these individual values, we can pick ranges. Uh, we can subdivide the entire thing into progressively larger and larger ranges. And each of those ranges, uh, if we keep an average for that, we can uh, compute essentially an estimate of the likelihood of, of encountering a particular tuple in there. In fact, we can do something very similar uh, if, if we, sorry, in fact, if, if we sort of take this to the logical extreme, all the way out to a single uh, count, this essentially devolves uh, down to counting the, uh, this essentially uh, devolves down to this uniform distribution assumption uh, that we had earlier. So essentially a histogram gives us a way of uh, keeping track of, uh, so essentially a histogram is uh, sort of a bucketization of, of the data that we're, we're looking at. Uh, every single tuple that falls into this particular bucket gets incorporated into this estimate, uh, this, this statistic that we're keeping track of. Uh, in other words, the number of uh, unique tuples uh, per, per value. So now if we... Okay, so any questions on, on histograms? Uh, and by a quick show of hands, can I see uh, how many people have encountered histograms before? Okay, so I'm not going to go too deeply on, on, on histograms. Uh, yeah, so in this case, you're, uh, you can't get, uh, you don't, if the ranges are at the same level as the keys, you can get the exact count. But as you create progressively uh, larger and larger ranges, you're, you're basically assuming a uniform distribution over all values in the bucket. So you can't get a uh, precise count of over, uh, you can't get a precise count at the granularity of, uh, of any individual value, but you can get uh, a more accurate estimate of what would be in that particular bucket. Does that answer your question? Okay. Um, 
So how do we actually use this? Uh, well, any, any other questions? Okay, so how do we actually use this? So here I have a histogram uh, over a data set. And let's say that this is the histogram uh, for attribute A in some data set. Uh, essentially what this means is that there are 20 values between 0 and 10, 15 between 20 and 30, uh, 30 values between 30 and 40, uh, 22 values, and, and, and so forth. Uh, is there a question? Oh, oops. Um, okay. Uh, assume that that's... Ah, there we go. That's why. Uh, that should be 60. That should be 70. Sorry. Um, great. So, to, uh, for example, there are 63 uh, values between 50 and 60. Um, okay, so how do we use this histogram to compute, the, uh, let's say, the, the probability, uh, the, redu sorry, the reduction factor uh, for the predicate A equals 33? Uh, is 125 
which divided by 170, again, our total number of, of tuples, uh, gives us 74% reduction factor. Now you'll note that there's uh, this sort of predicate gives us, a, or, or the histogram in this case, gives us a very, uh, a very good tool for analyzing the reduction factor of these particular predicates. Um, any predicate, if, uh, if the value you're comparing against is less than uh, 50, then you're going to have this whole block. So you have this nice turnover point uh, where this, the reduction factor suddenly becomes much smaller. Okay, I'm actually going through this quite a bit faster than I thought. Um, okay. Uh, so, any questions on histograms? Uh, not necessarily. Floating points work just as well. Um, this, uh, in this case, you can still assume a uniform distribution. Um, so, with a floating point, though, so let me rephrase. Uh, it's less useful for equality for floating point. Uh, but if you're if you're doing inequalities, you can still assume a uniform distribution of floating point numbers because this uh, that uh, predicate still covers 70 per, 70 percent of this bucket. There are one in seven tuples. Uh, if you assume a uniform distribution of, of values within each bucket, there's a one in seven uh, chance for each of those 30 tuples uh, to satisfy that predicate. Uh, I agree that uh, if this is a floating point number, then there is a uh, then this is a lot less useful for equality for like that. Sorry. Oh, strings. Um, strings are actually a lot harder. Um, you obviously can't do this sort of histogramming uh, directly on the string itself. Um, Off the top of my head, I don't believe there's a straightforward way of, of building a similar structure for, for strings. Although you can do things like prefixes. Um, so 26 buckets uh, for anything that starts with an A, anything that starts with a B, and so forth. So by default, the value that you said, any is about left and right. Sorry? So by default. Uh, well, in that case, everything's going to be an equality predicate.
There, okay, so there. Um, okay, sorry. So there are. Um, you're right. So this would be approximately one uh, for uh, if you if you wanted to compute the precise value of rank, you'd compute three divided by eight, which is not quite one third, slightly less than one third. Um, in this, uh, in the case of the example, it doesn't actually make a difference. Anything else? Yes. Keep things down, please. Thank you. Do a database is actually used histograms to optimize variance. Yeah. Uh, essentially, so you can use a histogram. Uh, the, the main use of a histogram is to compute. Uh, the reduction factor of an, of an equality or inequality uh, predicate much more efficiently than accurately. So, uh, they mean uh, histograms internally? Uh, yeah, so most database systems will actually uh, keep histograms over uh, most attributes that get indexed. Uh, keep in mind, this, uh, you don't need to, this is, excuse me, this is only relevant if you're, um, if you're actually indexing these. Uh, so for example, if, uh, if you don't have an index on A, then there's not much of a point in keeping, uh, keeping uh, a histogram for A. Because you're never really going to consider it. Uh, in order to compute A, you have to do a full page scan. Um, yes. So what you would do then is have a two-dimensional histogram. So for every pair of, uh, you bucket in in both dimensions. Uh, uh, so in this case, uh, age and one, two, three. So this, this process can be used just the same way uh, to compute an interval. 
So if I wanted to do, go from uh, 33, let's say uh, 55, then I get 70% uh, of the tuples in here, all of the tuples in here, and then 50% of the tuples in here. Okay. Uh, all right, so one last thing I want to cover, uh, cover today, this idea of uh, constraints. Now, this is actually uh, almost brain dead, uh, brain dead uh, obvious if, if you look at it for long enough. Uh, basically, you can use key at, uh, foreign key constraints in order to get better estimates as well. And just the really, really straightforward example of this would be uh, let's say you have. Um, Recall our recall our, our uh, Starfleet uh, officers and ships schema uh, relations. So if you do a join between officers and ships on ship ID, uh, we have the constraint. Every officer has exactly one ship. Yeah, uh, yeah, the ship ID. So if that's the case, 